Good afternoon, everyone. I, my name is Joe Hawk. I want to welcome you to the School-Based Mentoring Showcase, Strengthening Resilience and Engagement. Today we have uh, for our opening session, uh, some esteemed colleagues who are going to share some of their thoughts and perspectives on school-based mentoring, starting with Deborah Lake, who is our Director of Programming, Program Planning and Implementation. Uh, she, is, she works very closely with our co-presidents to provide leadership and direction for our work across uh, our work assisting pro prevention and mentoring initiatives across the state. And so she will be speaking on behalf of the partnership. We have Kari Sullivan, Sullivan Custer, who is the attendance lead at the Connecticut State Department of Education. Her work involves coordination across agency divisions and other state agencies and community providers to reduce academic barriers to student attendance. And she provides leadership and guidance to improving uh, student attendance to districts and schools throughout the 10 opportunity districts in the state. So we're very pleased to have her sharing the state perspective. And then we have Kermit Carolina. He is a longtime resident of New Haven at, who has proudly worked in his local community and for the New Haven Public Schools school district as a former student mentor, coach, teacher, and principal. He's a champion for evidence-based practices that foster positive, safe, and supportive learning environments designed to keep kids in schools out of the out of prison from out of the school to prison pipeline. Uh, so we're very pleased to have his perspective uh, to kick us off. So I am going to turn it over right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a few uh, housekeeping uh, slides that I, I must present. First, our disclaimer, the views presented today are those of the participants and the presenters and may not necessarily represent those of the Governor's Prevention Partnership. The information is provided for solely educational purposes and the Governor's Prevention Partnership is not liable for any outcomes related to the implementation of the materials presented here today. In terms of housekeeping, please keep your uh, microphones muted. Uh, and um, we are having a session today that includes our opening ceremony and our keynote session combined. It will be an hour and 15 minutes total. The session is being recorded as you've been notified. And we use these recordings for our website and for potential training opportunities. Given uh, the time, we will have question and answers at the end of the presentation, but you can always use the chat and we encourage you to use the chat to express your comments, questions, and we'll be monitoring it as we go. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Deborah Lake. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to add my own welcome to the showcase and thank you for joining us today. As we get started, I would like to pause and take a moment to hold space for the communities, schools and families who are grieving across the country due to some of the recent violent actions that have occurred. We recognize that this is a very difficult um, time and, and it can be hard to continue our work, especially as we come together to uh, today to uplift our schools and their positive impact in young people's lives. Tonight, the partnership will be holding a conversation that you are all invited to join. The event will be focused on helping young people process traumatic events such as what we've seen recently in New York, California, and Texas. There will be a panel of mental health experts at tonight's conversation sharing their insights and answering questions. Uh, the link to register for tonight's conversation is uh, being put into the chat right now and is also available on our website, preventionworkct.org. Today uh, is about the past, the present, and the future of school-based mentoring. 
The Governor's Prevention Partnership for more than 30 years has focused on building statewide capacity to prevent underage drinking and substance use and building strategic alliances to promote the, to promote the overall well-being of Connecticut's future workforce. We are a proud member of Connecticut's Prevention Infrastructure and affiliate of Mentor National. We know that young people are more likely to be healthy and successful if they feel that they have at least one positive connection with an adult. The partnership's work includes promoting and supporting mentoring programs through training and technical assistance, supporting the mentoring collaboratives, and highlighting the great work of the mentoring programs around the state. Today, we will be highlighting school-based mentoring. We're excited to be showcasing this historic work to engage students in their school environment. As you will hear, Connecticut was the very first to develop this model of mentoring, and together we can work to continue to be on the cutting edge of innovation while also ensuring safe, quality mentoring relationships. We are excited to be working on new initiatives with a renewed focus on our priorities after completing a strategic plan refresh earlier this year. And I am sure that some of you with us today gave feedback during the process and we thank you for your input. One of our top priority priorities is working with the Connecticut State Department of Education on a comprehensive plan for mentoring across the state. Our goal is to ensure that any school district can have access to mentors and support in finding the best model that will work for them and their students. We appreciate CSDE's commitment to mentoring and connections to families outside of the traditional classroom experience. As part of the plan for CSDE, and continuing our focused work that was started with Step Up CT Portal, we look to increase mentor recruitment. We will be rolling out several campaigns focused on recruiting mentors who may better reflect the profiles of the mentees being served, such as men and men of color. We will continue to do the work to translate our materials so they can be accessible in both English and Spanish and be relevant to mentoring subjects, but also the current challenges that our young people are facing and how to support them in the current climate. We are hearing from our young people that many feel anxious and they are struggling with their mental health. The impacts of COVID are being felt both at home and at school. The news can be overwhelming to us all and there are more dangers when engaging in risky behavior that includes unknown substances. Through our collective work, we can address these concerns and provide positive outcomes for our youth. Mentoring is dynamic and flexible, and the ability of programs to switch to virtual mentoring this two years ago was incredible. And it was no easy task, and we thank you all for continuing your work so that the youth were still served. Today is a day to highlight other ways in which mentoring can be dynamic and flexible. You'll be hearing a lot of more about where school-based mentoring started during the keynote. And the partnership is really proud to have been a part of it from the beginning. From there, you will have the opportunity to choose a session focused on youth substance use prevention or a session focused on leveraging emotional intelligence skills. After our breakouts, we'll come back together to learn about the future of everyday mentoring and how caring adults everywhere really can be a mentor and make a difference in the daily lives of youth. We hope that you learn something, that you connect with a new colleague or get inspired to access new resources from us through the National Mentoring Resource Center or others who are here today. Before I turn the floor over to our next speakers, I would like to take a moment to thank our lead researcher and evaluator, Joe Hawk, who you just heard from, for her leadership in bringing this showcase together and the partnerships team for supporting the work of today's program. Thank you to all of our speakers for sharing your time and talents with us all. And uh, we benefit from the wealth of knowledge and experience you bring to this event. And thank you to all of the participants for engaging in this work. Please ask questions, find connections, and keep in touch as we celebrate this incredible history and the promising future of school-based mentoring. Thanks so much. Thank you, Deborah. Next, I would like to introduce Kari Sullivan Custer, the attendance lead of the State Department of Education. Kari? Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today. School-based mentoring is an important component of the State Department of Education's commitment to having all students 
have a healthy and safe school experience. Um, I, I was a mentor myself for a number of years. He just turned 22 and we started when he was 11 and it had a profound impact on both my, my growth and his growth. I also would um, just want to give you um, sort of set the stage around attendance. We know attendance has um, what we call chronic absence, which is 10 missing 10% or more of the school has increased in, um, since the pandemic and um, doubled in, in many areas. And so what we have here is just to give you sort of a flavor of, of the data, um, you can see we were kind of trending along and at about 10% chronic absence. And we like to look at the numbers because that shows us these are real children and students. They're not a percentage. It's not a data point. These are our kids. And you can see in um, the data started to go up in 2019-20 when we ended the school year in March and we stopped taking attendance officially um, for the state collection. And then the end of last year, we jumped up to 94,506 students chronically absent, and that was 19% of them. So we doubled pretty much what we were on a typical year. However, we did see um, unexpectedly, I guess, um, chronic absence continue to go up this past year. In January, we were up to almost 130,000 students chronically absent. That was 26% um, due to Omicron, um, quarantine, isolation, um, and sickness, both students and children, I mean, students and teachers and staff, we were, um, we were really suffering with COVID with the Omicron in January, but we are seeing that data trend down, more students are coming back to school. And so we know that since January, we're down to 118,000 students, which is, um, let me see, about, um, hmm, I'm thinking we drop, uh, I'm not gonna do the math because that's, but I'm gonna go, it's about 12,000 less students chronically absent since January to April. And we're really proud of that. And we know that the school districts are working hard. And um, next slide, please. And chronic absence and attendance matters now more than ever. We know that students who are absent in the first month of school is a great predictor for poor attendance through the school year. So we start early. Um, half the students who miss two to four days in September go on to miss uh, more school in the school year. We know that if the students are not reading in kindergarten or by third grade, um, if they're chronically absent in kindergarten, they may not be able to read by third grade. By sixth grade, chronic absence is a leading indicator of dropout of high school. And now more than ever, we wanna make sure we're paying attention to those students who are not coming to school. Next slide, please. Because we know this highlighted part that relationships are what students are looking for in school and that not all of our students have a strong supportive relationship in school. This is the positive conditions for learning, which include physical and emotional health and safety, belonging, connection, and support, academic challenge and engagement, and a, a adult and student well-being and emotional competence. And right at the center of that is relationships are key. Um, we are doing a lot in Connecticut around home visits. The, um, through ESSER funding, we have been able to expand home visits through 15 districts. And um, we've done, um, I think, nearly 30,000 home visits over the last year. And as we get these students back to school, you know, we, we build relationships with families and students start to come back to school. We want to make sure there's adults there who can connect with those students and engage with them so that they want to keep going to school. And that's where school-based mentors can make a difference. Next slide, please. And this, um, this slide is um, something I was just playing around with. I, I am not a designer, but I just wanted to show we have our students and right now our students are leaving school and going into all of the wonderful summer camps. Um, this year we're expanding enrichment camps and, um, and summer school for all students, but what's to keep them engaged over summer, but we need to make sure that when they come back to school in the fall, we are ready for them and there are adults to engage them in these positive relationships. And again, that's where school-based mentors um, will, will help fill that void, whether it's a teacher or another uh, uncertified staff, someone who non-certified staff, some of the, the um, 
the athletic director or the secretary or the music teacher or somebody who can connect with those students and their interests. Next slide, please. So over the next year, we're working um, on mental health, strengthening mental health support, strengthening relationships. As I mentioned, we have the summer enrichment and innovation opportunities where there'll be lots of young people for a lot of college students and core um, students who will be engaging the youth. And then we're increasing our LEAP home visits over the summer and into next school year. We're gonna have school-based mentoring. We're very excited about our partnership with the um, Governor's Prevention Partnerships. So we'll have success mentors, we'll have some check and connect, and we'll continue all of our work with our um, external and internal partners to, to continue to strengthen, strengthen those partnerships for schools and community partners. Next slide, please. Okay, well, thank you very much. And um, like I said, we look forward to a continued uh, con partnership. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, Kari, that was very informative. Our next speaker is Kermit Carolina, and he is the supervisor of New Haven School District. He has agreed to give us comments both at the beginning and end of our, our showcase today. So Kermit, do you have a moment? Yeah, so I just, let me say good afternoon to everyone. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just gonna talk to you informally for a minute about a couple of things, okay? And uh, as we move forward. Um, first of all, it is a pleasure to be on with all of you. It makes me feel good to know that uh, there are partners out there who are doing this work, uh, trying our best to really engage young people and uh, keep young people in schools and off the streets uh, and keep them moving in a positive direction, uh, particularly uh, considering what we're dealing with as a nation right now. Uh, for me specifically, uh, my life work has centered around um, high poverty neighborhoods. Uh, particularly here in New Haven. Um, and a lot of the work that I continue to do is in that area. Um, one of the major concerns um, that is leading to the push for more mentorship uh, is the disproportionate uh, exclusion of uh, Black and Latino students out of school, school buildings. Um, and we know that is two, is a twofold, uh, that's a twofold challenge. We have the challenges where our schools uh, obviously can be better. Um, but we also have the challenge where our young people need support uh, and so that they're able to relate with the adults in the school buildings and in the community and deal with authority, period, uh, in, in the right ways. So uh, having a responsible, consistent and positive adult in their life um, who can support them with their decision making is very important. Um, you know, there are many barriers to success that our young people are facing. Uh, and obviously a lot of our young people in these high poverty neighborhoods are, are caught in a vicious cycle of poverty. And what I mean by that is they live in high poverty neighborhoods. Some come from dysfunctional households. Uh, we're finding that uh, some have absent parents uh, from the household. Uh, we see that our students are failing as a result of uh, their experiences uh, as young people, as adolescents, uh, which is leading to school failure. Um, which is eventually leading to the school to prison pipeline, which is incarceration. And then from the incarceration, we see that these young people, many of them uh, males, black, Latino, special education, um, uh, become perpetrators or victims of community violence. So that, so for me, it's really, uh, it's, it's, I, I can't tell you the crisis that, that we're dealing with right now and how serious this is. Um, if I had to share some quick data with you, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, um, you know, uh, the school to prison pipeline. Uh, we have 40% of uh, black students who are suspended each year in school buildings or expelled actually across the country. 70% of all school arrests are black and Latino males. Uh, black and Latino males are three and a half times more likely to be suspended than white students. Uh, and black and Latino students are twice as likely not to graduate from high school. And uh, if you notice that blacks and Latinos are 30% of the United States population, but more than 63% of those incarcerated. And those in prison, 68% of those in prison, males in prison, do not have a high school diploma. So I just want to give you just a, a brief understanding of the urgency and the crisis uh, that, that we're confronted with here. Excuse me one second, I'll get this light back on. Uh -uh. I'm in a room where the light goes off automatically. <laughs> with, so I have to get up every once in a while and move. Um, so I, I'm just sharing the crisis with you, but I can tell you this much, uh, as part of the predictors of their school success, 
Uh, we need uh, obviously adults who can help them stay on uh, time on task. Uh, so we need their relationships with their teachers and, and educators to be uh, you know, a, a very uh, powerful one with uninterrupted instructional time. So the un in order to have un uninterrupted instructional time, we need to ensure that we are not excluding students, uh, that we're meeting their social emotional needs and their academic needs. Uh, and obviously we need advocates and those advocates come in the form of adult mentors uh, to advocate for them, to provide safe spaces for them to continue to develop their academic skills uh, and to continue to develop their reading skills. Uh, someone mentioned earlier the relationship with a positive adult. Um, that adult obviously should have moral authority, should be someone who raises, uh, has high expectations for the student um, and can help the student develop a success plan, who are cheerleaders and coaches for these students and who are reliable and consistently available. Uh, obviously the partnership with parents is very important as well. As a third factor, the engagement of parent, uh, of the parent or key adult before a problem occurs, we wanna catch students early and we wanna do more prevention work versus more intervention. And uh, last but not least, uh, the positive and supportive school climate. I think it's important that we continue to fight for uh, and, and encourage our school administrators and other educators to provide this environment. It should be an environment where expectations are, are high for achievement and where their um, successes are celebrated. We have to have patience and support for these young people as they develop during adolescent stage. Sometimes we all forget that we were adolescents at one time and we were not perfect. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately we're, we're, we're starting to see where we're almost criminalizing uh, some of our adolescent behaviors, but in the same breath, considering what's going on in the country is understood that we have to be a lot more cautious as we move forward. And last but not least, the emotional connections and engagement of our students are extremely important. So I just want to give you a quick synopsis. I want to say welcome. I'm looking forward uh, to listening uh, today and, uh, and obviously learning from all of you. And I hope that anything I share is also helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always so inspirational to hear people who are in the field, people who are in state agencies promoting education for our young people to really highlight why we're all here, what, what it's all about. Uh, it's about um, you know, promoting the, the opportunities for our young people to excel and reach their full potential. And uh, Kermit, you have highlighted the importance of the work that we're doing for really addressing some of the inequities that exist in our society. And uh, that, that's very important. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kari and Deborah, for your, your thoughtful and inspirational words to kick off the summit. So I would like to uh, move on to our keynote. Uh, it is entitled 30 Years of School-Based Mentoring, Creating, Celebrating the Past, Evolution, and Current Trends, and a Look into the Future. And this uh, presentation is uh, going, our keynote presentation is presented by Su Dr. Susan Weinberger, uh, AKA Dr. Mentor. Uh, Dr. Susan Weinberger has uh, been a pioneer in the creation of school-based mentoring in the United States. In, back in the 1980s, she started the first um, school-based mentoring program right here in Connecticut. And over the last 25 years, she has spent her time uh, really providing technical assistance and guidance to mentoring providers uh, that are implementing all sorts of all models of, of uh, mentoring and to help them design, implement, and evaluate high quality school site and community-based mentoring programs. And today she's gonna to be joined by um, some colleagues who are in the field providing mentoring programs. Sarah Furman is the Wellness Prevention and Mentoring Coordinator up for the East Lyme Schools. She's trained clinically and she has been providing, uh, leading the mentoring uh, program in East Lyme and providing before that uh, clinical services to families who were in jeopardy of losing their children to losing custody of their children to the Department of Children and Families uh, due to substance use. We have, and her colleague Annalise Spaziano, 
who is the assistant super superintendent of the East Lyme Public Schools. She has more than 23 years of experience working in multiple roles in education. She's won the Teacher of the Year Award and the Environmental Educator of the Year Award. In Milford, she was instrumental in developing a peer mentoring program where high school students served as mentors for elementary school students. And now that she's joined East Lyme, she's enthusiastic about uh, reinstating the mentoring program in that school system. We have uh, Faith Harrison Velagas, who is the executive director of Bridgeport Public Education Fund. Uh, she is trained as a social worker dedicate and has dedicated her life to educating and empowering youth across the state. She's worn many hats, including being the program coordinator of the Mentoring for Academic Achievement and the College and Career Success Program. And today she is joining us to share her passion for collaborating with schools and nonprofits to really help youth in the, ed, in the Bridgeport community thrive. And finally, we have Jasmine Prezi, who is the director of the Human Services Council Norwick program, uh, Mentor Program. Uh, she is a unique person who has been in, she really, the role is, has brought her full circle. She started as a mentee in the Norwalk Mentor Program, and she has been a mentor in it and now she is the director of it. So she brings us a very unique perspective. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Weinberger, no, I'm sorry, to uh, begin her presentation. Well, thank you so much, Joe. And thanks to everybody who preceded me. I'm sorry for the, the voice and the congestion. I, uh, I did test positive for COVID and I'm on the way back. So I'm, I really looked forward to today and certainly hope that I could be here with all of you. It is 35 years that we are celebrating school-based mentoring. And I often wonder how many people know the story of how it first began. And today I was given the opportunity to share that with you as I take a look back and a trip down memory lane. And in order to do that, we really have to go back to 1904 because that was the birth of the Big Brothers Big Sisters movement in America. And if you know the BBBS movement, you know that typically all the matches originally took place after school and on the weekends. And for many, they still do. There were three or four hours a week of the matches meeting together with supervision from staff. None of those mentors and mentees were referred to with that term. They were always called bigs and littles. In fact, you may be interested to know that the term mentee was coined by many of us who were experts in the field of school-based mentoring. And about eight years ago, we finally worked hard enough to get that term mentee in the Merriam Collegiate Dictionary, and no one was prouder than I was. Um, with the Big Brother Big Sister movement, originally they had maximum age limitations, typically 14 year olds, pretty much the last time that you could be mentored. But even for Big Brothers Big Sisters who has a school-based mentoring program now, that age limitation has changed. Next slide. From those years with Big Brothers Big Sisters came something called adopt a school. And I want you to know that that term adopt a school was coined by a Detroit group of businessmen during the riots. They all got together in a boardroom and said, let's adopt a school and assist these kids and their teachers. Some of the schools felt like orphans that needed to be adopted. That particular program, Adopt a School, is now known as School Business Partnerships. In the early 1980s, 
In my role as a central office administrator with the Norwalk, Connecticut Public Schools, I initiated the first Adopt-A-School program. I thought it was really a great idea. And companies like Pepperidge Farm, Norton Systems, United Technologies, Burke and Elmer, Louis Dreyfus, Deloitte and Touche, Occidental Chemical and others actually adopted a school and offered them used and new equipment, which we can still, still benefit from today, executives on loan, tutoring and seminars, and trainings for many of our teachers. It was a very exciting and successful program. Next slide. I'm putting Joe to work today. Thank you, Joe. And then came the birth of school-based mentoring. In 1986, school-based mentoring grew out of a need for the human element. Please let me explain. As I traveled around to the classrooms in our elementary, middle, and high schools in Norwalk, I noticed that there were many young people who appeared to be unmotivated in school. And when I asked teachers what they thought the problem was, many of them said, Susan, so many of these young people have no one who cares about them and supports them. And as one of my predecessors on, the, on this webinar today said, to be their cheerleader. And I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we took the same companies in Norwalk that were involved in adopter school and tap them for this program, because this way the human element would be the most critical and could be addressed through school-based mentoring. Occidental Chemical Corporation was actually the first company in America who became involved with school-based mentoring. And then one year later, they moved to Texas. And before they moved, they did something that I will never forget. They actually had the CEO of Occidental Chemical take a little trip over to meet with the CEO of Translux Corporation and said, we're leaving, but we cannot leave our kids. Would you please take over where we left off? And Translux was a long time member of the program. I will tell you that during the early years, as we examined the beginnings of school-based mentoring, the schools and the school district had total buy-in. Mentors were released one hour a week to, to work at a local school. And the most interesting thing is in those years, we thought geography was the key. So we took a great big map and we put it up in the office and we put little pins next to the name of every school in Norwalk. And then we determined which corporation was the closest to that school. We had a feeling that if you didn't have to travel far to go for your school-based mentoring sessions, it might make it easier. I don't think we can do that so easily today. But at that time, geography was very important. And the most important thing is that in the early years of school-based mentoring, the focus was totally friendship-based. It was a chance to reach youth with support, caring, trust, encouragement and that word cheerleading again. Next slide. Each school had a school liaison from the very beginning of school-based mentoring. Teachers and social workers and guidance counselors recommended youth for the program. But I identified three key ingredients to a successful effort. One was an outstanding educational leader. And by that, I meant the principal a dedicated teaching staff that didn't say, is this one more thing I must do in my busy day? And a friendly secretary in the main office. Now I can assure you that even though school-based mentoring has come a long way since 35 years ago, I still believe that if we have an outstanding educational leader as the principal and a dedicated teaching staff, including our social workers and guidance counselors, and that friendly secretary who's the first person in the main office who greets the mentor and says, how are you today? And I can tell you that your mentee is waiting very patiently to see you. 
you've got a strong, vital, and very successful school-based program. Next slide. Mentors only met at school and they were truly trusted listeners. The application process was pretty much as we know it today, but here's something that's interesting. There were no criminal background checks. Now I can blame that on the superintendent of schools in Norwalk that I worked with for many years. And this was his philosophy. He said, now look, all of these mentors are coming from the community. They're only working with the kids at school. Um, there's plenty of supervision at the school. And we know them all. We don't need criminal background checks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boy, has have things changed since then. We only match the same gender. We, of course, had preparation and adequate training. And we always had post surveys. And we found out that satisfied mentors and youth began to show changes, especially the youth in terms of attitude, self-esteem, relationships with family and peers, and they seemed happier at school. Next slide. Marketing was also key to recruitment, and so was something that um, I heard earlier in terms of um, Deborah saying how important it is that we're going to be going forward recruiting more and more mentors for the program through the GPP. We always had an event called Mentor One and Recruit One. And you couldn't get in as a veteran mentor unless you brought one more possible mentor with you. And that was a wonderful way to recruit new mentors because it's word of mouth, but also if a mentor says, come and learn more about mentoring from me and some of my colleagues, and maybe then you will join. We always had ongoing support by school li liaisons and learned that the difference between programs that fizzled and died or lasted the long term was ongoing support from school liaisons. Mentors craved the support then, and I believe they also crave the support today. Next slide. Every end of the year, we had big thank you events for mentors at different companies. And we had a theme song. I'm going to be interested to know if Jasmine knows this. Bet Midler's Wind Beneath My Wings. You are my hero, everything I've ever wanted to be. And you know, to this day, when I hear Bet Midler sing Wind Beneath My Wings, I still start to cry. And we always had closure steps because if mentors and their parents and the mentees age appropriate sign a mentor agreement when they start in the program, they have to also start um, uh, sign a mentor agreement when they close their relationship. This is to ensure maximum protection. And we always had a year end breakfast to thank the liaisons because the liaisons are really pretty special to us. And in most programs, they do not get paid. So we have to thank them often. And every year at the end of the year in June, we had a one page list of mentors in the local newspaper and businesses always paid for the ads. Next slide. Ah, and now the media started to get involved and I began to watch what was happening to that little program that I started in 1986. In 1990, Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership was born. And in 1998 uh, was the creation of state partnerships, including the Connecticut Mentoring Partnership, now known as the Governor's Prevention Partnership. And the Center for Health Communications at Harvard School of Public Health created the Harvard Mentoring Project. 2002 was the first National Mentoring Month and now we have National Mentoring Month every January, no matter what. And they put out and continue to put out some incredible, incredible public service announcements about the importance of mentoring. And suddenly Connecticut and the country wanted replication of the Norwalk school-based model. Next slide. You see, I'm getting excited about this. I'm always excited talking about mentoring. Now, many of you have read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, How Little Things Can Make a Difference. 
that moment of critical mass, the magic moment when an idea crosses a threshold. Believe me when I tell you that there's no single event in the history of mentoring that thrust us into becoming a movement than the President's Summit on America's Future. It is now called America's Promise. It occurred in Philadelphia on April 28th in 1997. President Bill Clinton, General Colin Powell, I noticed I spelled his name wrong, and all living presidents, corporate CEOs, and 30 governors, including Connecticut's John Rowland, stood on the steps of Independence Hall and announced the five fundamental resources that kids would need to be, to be successful today. And guess what? Mentoring was number one. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I was such a lucky lady to be there. Next slide. And then the first federal grants changed the landscape. By early 2000s, the first large grant was given to local school-based mentoring programs by the US Department of Education. There were three expected outcomes written in the grants, improved academic performance, improved attendance, and a minimum of one, minimum of one year of the match. That grant lasted eight years, multi-million dollar grant, and then it ended. And I'd like to tell you the reason why. The expectations were too high. The people who wrote the grant were not at the grassroots level, level of school-based mentoring. They didn't realize that all the programs at that point were friendship-based and there was really no tutoring, no ability for the mentors to help improve academic performance. So that expectation was not achieved. And there were many mentors that could not stay in the program with their match for an entire year. And I think that's because the programs then were not doing a good enough job of supporting them. But one thing did come out of this grant that was absolutely amazing. And Carrie, I hope you're still on the call because you'll love this. The only successful outcome was that we were beginning to see that in school-based mentoring, attendance began to improve. But that's really understandable because if a mentor knows to ask a mentee every week when they get together, how are you doing? What can I do to help you? Were you in school every day last week? And on time, attendance is going to improve. Next slide. Oh, I just heard bra bravo from Carrie. Thank you so much for hanging in there with me. And suddenly friendship base moved to focus base. Two more federal agencies became involved in funding mentoring the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Juvenile Justice and, De De um, Dependent uh, Juvenile De Justice and Delinquency Prevention, which today is the largest funder of school-based mentoring. And the focus-based mentoring programs ranged from a youth with a parent in prison and a big program at Arizona State University where I just de delivered a, a workshop uh, on the mentees who have a parent in prison and what the schools and teachers need to do and youth in foster care and juvenile detention homes and a lot of work that I've done on Indian reservations with tribal leaders working with young people and therapeutic mentoring and peer to peer. And I must say our secretary of education, who of course is a native of Connecticut, spoke so glowingly in January at the National Mentoring Summit about peer to peer mentoring and how important and successful it is today and group mentoring. Next slide. So friendship and focus-based um, focus mentoring became more formal. And the guidelines pretty much stayed the same, recruitment, screening, training, matching, ongoing support, marketing, recognition, renewal, and closure, and evidence-based approaches. 
and the elements of effective practice that have been the Bible of school-based mentoring since have really helped to ensure maximum protection for young people. And schools are very concerned about protecting those young people. Next slide. I do wanna mention um, a few publications before I go on, including Mentoring a Movement, my personal journey, which I wrote about the beginnings and the evolution of school-based mentoring and all the places that I traveled to replicate it. The My Mentor and Me series, Preparing My Mentor for Me and those little activities books that so many of you have when mentors work with young people in our schools and a lot of newsletters and articles and forward to several books that have been published in America and England. But two important items, two important publications I call your attention to now. One, I wrote um, for Phi Delta Kappa, the National Education Honorary uh, for Backtalk. And it's on the role of mentors in reducing chronic absenteeism. It's a quick read if you want to see it. I'll be happy to send it to you. And it is really compelling. It talks about how mentors can really make a difference in improving school attendance. And also a chapter that I wrote in the Handbook of Youth Mentoring, if you want to look it up, on program funding, because I know so many of our programs are struggling today on how they can get more funding to keep their programs going. So that was a little commercial message. I hope you don't mind. Next slide. So now we have a whole different ball game with school-based mentoring. We focus on literacy and reverse chronic absenteeism and improved academic performance and long-term relationships through high school graduation and college scholarships, which you're gonna hear about soon and college mentoring, which I'm very involved in these days. It's really amazing. And you're also going to hear soon from two of my colleagues about the potential role of families in school-based mentoring. And when the superintendent takes the lead as an, and is a mentor herself or himself, you're going to have a successful program. Next slide. Well, we have more examples of focus-based school-based mentoring. We have career intentions and readiness and college planning and mental and physical health. We hear so much about the issues around mental and physical health today, this past week in the news, this past year, it seems to never stop. Belonging and identity and learning better social skills and serving rural youth through virtual mentoring and youth facing chronic illness and stigmatized identities disruptive behavior, and youth who are being bullied in schools, and youth with disabilities. And we're finding niches in school-based mentoring for all of them. That's okay, Joe, you can go on. And don't worry, Joe, I'm watching the time here. And we also have wonderful software to track data collection and relationships and make making outcomes more available. And oh my goodness, we've since spent so much time on virtual and hybrid mentoring. And I'm gonna stop here for a minute and tell you a prediction. I think that more corporate mentors are gonna get involved in re being recruited as mentors going forward if they can do it a combination of virtual and hybrid because they're busy people and they can't go to see the kid at the school every week. But if they can see him over Zoom, twice a month and maybe once a month in person and once a month through email, text or FaceTime, I think they've got it made. And due to the pandemic, more focus on youth needing mental health services and additional training of mentors to work with challenging youth. Next slide. And COVID has affected mentoring. We have COVID chaos. Mentees are asking, where is my mentor? They've been looking for them for two years. Funding has been threatened. Budgets have been revised. There's been reduced staff. Schools were closed. There were gaps in sessions. And some school districts had to start all over again. And we also have screen fatigue. Limited staff support to manage online programs. Next slide. So we're going to look ahead. 
And first of all, I have to tell you that school-based programs cannot do it alone. We need to explore multiple partners in the community. And what I'm really, really pleased about is that all three of our presenting programs are partner-based. And they all know that without partnerships, school-based mentoring in the years to come are not going to be successful. And the other thing looking ahead in terms of chronic absenteeism, since we know it's a national and Connecticut crisis, is that when mentors work with mentees in those communities where attendance is an issue, focusing on short and long-term goals to improve attendance will have great impact. The schools will love it and the donors will too. So everyone who knows me knows me, knows that we have to set those short-term goals between mentors and mentees and setting a goal for improving attendance is the way to go. Next slide. And now it is my pleasure to introduce actually one, two, three, four of my colleagues. The first two, as you heard from Joe, is Sarah Furman, who is the Viking Mentoring Program Coordinator for the East Lyme Youth Service Bureau, and Annalise Spaziano, who is the Assistant Superintendent in the East Lyme Public Schools. And Joe will give them the next slide. As you can see, it's a partnership between the schools and youth services, and I'll pass it on to Sarah and Annalise to take it over. Thank you, Dr. Weinberger. I really appreciate your words um, and your message today. So hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be joining you to share a little bit about East Lyme's journey as it relates to school-based mentoring. Um, before I begin, I do want to thank my colleagues on this panel who have truly made it at their life's work to support student success in school and life through a focus on mentoring. I'm honored and humbled to be presenting alongside of you today. And additionally, as we continue to experience the horrific violence in schools across our country, I'm hopeful about the impact this work can have on our students who may need it the most. So I'll share a little bit about Eastline. We are fairly new to the school-based mentoring process. Um, and it was something that we started to explore back in 2018 um, as a result of increased behavior referrals at um, certain grade levels. And actually this work happened before Sarah and I's time in Eastline. So um, we are both new and working together to sort of help reestablish it and get it back up off the ground. Um, but I'm grateful to the work that was done by the committee that was formed in 2018 um, that was brought together. Uh, and there were representatives of various stakeholders, including administration, teachers, central office, safety and security, student and parent representatives. Um, and those folks began to explore the potential of a, adopting a school-based mentoring program as a proactive measure in supporting students who um, maybe struggling or demonstrating some challenging behaviors. Um, so fast forward to the spring of 2019, we were lucky enough to have Dr. Mentor come to East Lyme and join forces with the committee to discuss, uh, you know, the essentials of what it would take to get a school-based uh, mentoring program up off the ground. I know she served as a great consultant to the district as we began to build the program from the ground up. Um, so as processes and procedures were being developed in East Lyme to, get move, to begin moving forward with this process, um, we at the same time started to begin our recruiting process for mentors um, and began um, training those folks. Um, so the following fall, the fall of November in 2019, we were able to um, start the program on a small scale and we started in fourth and fifth grade. Um, from there, um, the program uh, in its initiation, it was experiencing um, a lot of initial success, and we were really, really uh, hopeful around the potential of the prog program moving forward. And then, as we all know, all of our lives came to a screeching halt March of 2020 um, when COVID came upon us. Um, despite the pandemic, pandemic, I can share that some of our mentor-mentee relationships 
um, continued um, and they still continue today. And we're really, ha we're really happy about that. Um, and some ha did not, you know, and so, um, you know, when we came back to school um, this fall and I had transitioned in East Lyme in July, um, I had a couple of staff members here in East Lyme reach out to me to talk to me about the mentoring program, um, how valuable it was before, um, you know, we had our lives had been interrupted and how hopeful they were to, to get it up off the ground again. At the same time, I'm also really grateful that um, the East Lyme community um, agreed to um, invest in a wellness prevention and mentoring co coordinator and onboarded my colleague, Sarah Furman, um, uh, as that position. And so Sarah and I had connected. Um, and at this moment in time, I'm going to pass it off to her, who, who and she's going to share a little bit about where we are now in the process um, as uh, we continue to, um, to grow the program. Sarah? Thank you, Annalise. And hello, everyone. So to pick up where Annalise left off, um, in 2021, it was brought to the attention of the school administration and the youth services that there was an interest in relaunching the program. Um, the program was a very important part of East Lyme and the youth services. So in order to relaunch the program, it was important for us to look at the areas that were successful and areas that needed to be restructured. Um, my position was created and in doing so, East Lyme Youth Services took over the responsibilities of the program and we collaborate with the schools and help oversee the program. During the re relaunch of the program, we reestablished the mentoring committee, which includes myself and Annalise, and our school liaisons. It was important for us to really build that relationship with the school liaisons and partner with them in identifying potential mentees within the schools that would benefit from the program. We have a small group of mentors that have resumed in person and we continue to recruit new members to help grow the program. We started off with offering the program to fourth and fifth grade, but now we are looking at identifying potential mentees in elementary, middle, and high school. And it's important for us to really um, include the family and encourage them to have communication with the school liaisons about their children that may be in the program. And I did see a comment come through from Annalise. Just give me one second. Oh, Annalise, that question was for you. They wanted to know who was paired in the mentoring program and what grade levels and what criteria for placement. Okay, so um, I mean, we can pr probably take this together, Sarah. Um, this yep. year, as Sarah has just shared, we we have agreed as a committee to sort of open it up beyond fourth and fifth grade. Um, I know that um, initially we were seeing a lot of need in our fifth grade in particular. And so that was a priority area for us and still continues to be. Um, but in speaking to our liaisons, there have been um, other um, students who have experienced whether it's loss in their family or who are struggling and continuing, you know, struggling in school to develop relationships. Um, so the criteria is broad and we really actually leave it up to the school-based team to discuss who might really benefit from having a mentor and we have a referral process. So they refer the student to Sarah and I, Sarah and I look at that referral and then we decide, um, you know, whether or not it's appropriate to move forward with pairing them with a mentor. Um, but it, it's essentially, we ask them to tell us you know, what are the reasons why you think this child would really benefit from having a mentor? Um, so it's, it's pretty open-ended. We don't have specific criteria associated with it. I hope that helps, Elizabeth. And I do want to note too, that when we are matching our mentors and mentees, we look to see what interests they have in common to help us really place our mentees with an appropriate mentor for them. Right, good point, Sarah. So we ask both our mentees and our mentors, what are their likes and interests 
and that is something that Sarah and I use to help establish um, what we think will be a good working relationship, mentee mentor working relationship. Okay. Sarah, did you want to add anything else um, with family involvement, or do you want me to pick up with uh, the mandated reporting? I think you can pick up with the mandated reporting. Thank you, Annalise. Yeah, so um, one of the things that surfaced in our committee work um, that I think is new, uh, well, I know is new, and something we didn't necessarily ask our mentors to, um, to go through in the past is um, to engage in the online DCF mandated reporting training. Now, we know our mentors are not mandated reporters. However, we really feel as though the information in that training is really helpful and provides them with a certain level of capacity to respond should a, a student share something with them that would be concerning or that they would need to reach out to a staff member to share with, with, a, um, with a building based liaison. So um, we did actually, um, that is a change that we've made um, since our initial launch of the program. And um, I don't know, Sarah, if you wanna share any uh, feedback you've gotten from the mentors from that training. Um, yeah, the, our mentors that have gone through the training were very pleased at how quick it was and how they are now feeling more supported and comfortable with what topics or issues that may arise that they might need support in. Um, and knowing that this is a partnership and they're not gonna be left alone to kind of figure out and navigate where to go with whatever concern and information may be reported to them. Right, and this is not as a result of something that's happened in the district, but we're just trying to really be proactive and provide them with um, you know, the background knowledge they need to be successful should that ever, um, they ever encounter um, information that would need to be reported to a liaison. Um, and then in terms of future programming, as you had heard from um, the, my introduction, I, uh, my previous, in my previous district worked really hard with um, our uh, peer advocate group at the high school level to develop a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. And um, that was met with an um, incredible high level of success. We had high school students traveling um, to our elementary buildings in Milford to, this was before COVID, to meet face-to-face -face during lunchtime or um, when the students were dismissed from school um, to spend some time with those students. And um, when COVID had hit, we were able to continue that program through a hybrid model where um, they were, they were um, meeting over uh, Zoom. And that was also a very successful model for us. Um, so that is something that Sarah and I have discussed as maybe potentially our next level of work is engaging um, some of our youth um, as resources in district. And um, what that looks like yet, we're not sure, um, but we know we do have a peer mentoring group at the high school. So, um, you know, we will be working with the, um, the advisor of that club to talk about the potential of uh, perhaps piloting something small um, next year in relation to um, peer to peer mentoring. So we're really looking forward to that. Yeah. And I will hand it back to Ms. Hawk, who I know is our, there we go. Okay. Thanks Thank everybody. Now, actually I'll introduce Faith. Okay. And th Thank you, Annalise and Sarah. And I think you're doing wonderful work and I'm just so honored to have you on, on the panel with me. And our next speaker is Faith Villegas, who is the executive director of the Bridgeport Public Education Fund. And Joe, if you put up the next slide, we'll hear from Faith. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, thank you all again for um, attending today and making it possible. And if you haven't guessed by now, we're all very passionate about um, the concept, but also the um, what the intention and value of mentoring. So without uh, belaboring that point, I wanna just share a little bit about uh, what we do here at the Bridgeport Public Education Fund. Uh, and that's where you see BPEF, it's an acronym, Bridgeport Public Education Fund. And it is the overarching organization that supports two programs. And our first program is the MAPS program. And much like um, Dr. Mentor talked about, 
we were also early in the stages of mentoring. Our, our program actually began in 1988. So thank goodness we're uh, approaching 35 years and um, it kind of feels like those dog years in a sense. You've been doing it for a while, but um, we learn a lot every year. So it's called the MAX program, Mentoring for Academic Achievement and College and Career Success. And our primary focus was to really uh, address the high school dropout rate and the low college attendance rate for Bridgeport Public School students. And you would think that that would be enough, <laughs> but it absolutely was not. Um, so I'm gonna take a step back and, and really talk about why the organization was funded or, and founded. So the Bridgeport Public Education Fund um, was founded by four people. And those four founding members came from the business community, believe it or not. And um, it was kind of, um, it kind of felt different in a sense because I was under the impression that we would do more career-based work. We would do more um, work with respect to getting students into, um, you know, places of business, giving them business mentors, or um, just really working with them in a different capacity. I did not believe that uh, when I first heard about this organization that it was really passionate about um, ensuring public education and every educator that's sitting in front of our students in any given classroom had the resources that they needed, they had the supports that they needed, but they also had a community that showed that they care. And for me, I think that's really, really important to emphasize a community that cares because the four founding members, one was the president of uh, People's United Bank, formerly People's United Bank, uh, Mr. David Carson. Another one was the, um, at that time, the editor for the Connecticut Post. Most people know her as Betty Freem, but her name is Elizabeth M. Freem. So uh, she was also instrumental in establishing the Bridgeport Public Education Fund. And another young lady, Phyllis Gustafson Marsilius, was another um, executive in corporate and nonprofit um, sectors. And she was able to, again, help the Bridgeport Public Education Fund understand that as businesses, as potential employers for students coming out of the Bridgeport Public Schools, they felt it was really critical that the community, that the business community, not just the broader community, but the business community really had some uh, part in the, the uh, lack of better term, if you will, but they really needed to have some skin in the game, right? So let, let's not just be present in this community because we are a for-profit model, but how can we be present in a sense that we're thinking about the student outcomes, not just about our business incomes? And that was a really um, pivotal moment, if you will. And as Dr. Mentor talked about, um, having that support from corporate partners, having that support from businesses who understand that while we're in this community, let's be great community partners. So that was really, uh, the beginning, if you will, of the Bridgeport Public Education Fund. And their mission even um, closely aligned with the original founding of the Bridgeport Public Education Fund. The original mission states that we wanted to develop programs and mobilize the community for, pub for quality public education in Bridgeport. And try as we might, from 1983 to 1988, we were doing small mini grants to classrooms and, and teachers with the belief that if students were engaged and, and loved what they were learning, then it would impact the outcomes. So they did that for a number of years and said, you know what, I think we actually have to dig a little bit deeper. And that deeper was when the MAX program got started. We started at one high school, it was Bassett High School, and um, one site person, which it was like, that felt like a lot of work. But um, it actually helped the Bridgeport Public Education Fund be able to assess, be able to uh, understand student needs, but also 
understand that each school had a different culture. Each one of the high schools in our community had different leadership, right? Pretty obvious, but also if we wanted to expand, if we really wanted to um, put our money where our mouth is, if you will, we really needed to have a better understanding of not just where we are right now, so far as we're the Ed Fund, we wanna do these things because the business community wants, you know, educated potential employers or customers, right? We really needed to take a step back and say, what are we doing here? And, and it was really, really valuable in a way that it allowed for the Bridgeport Public Education Fund to grow beyond its initial thinking uh, of we're gonna do these things and the quality of education was just gonna magically improve. We got into the direct service with the MAX program in 1988 and we did that for a really, really long time. <laughs> And we still do that right now. And I love it because right now, as we are currently tracking our data, and I started doing some of this stuff last week, we are approaching 7,200 students who have been mentored in our high school programs. So remember I said we started with one high school in 1988. One high school, 12 students, one site manager. If we wanted to grow, we had to grow our thinking and we had to grow the scope of the program. And, and that growth came when we were able to start looking at some of our universities that are local to us, such as Fairfield University, Sacred Heart University, University of Bridgeport, uh, Houston Tonic Community College. And we said, hmm, we need help. We need more hands than just the one, right? And that's when the model of, some would call it near peer model, where we have college students that come in and they actually report to the high school during the school day to sit with the student for at least 45 minutes for 26 weeks to really talk about, wow, what are we gonna do? What is, as a young person, am I going to college? Am I going to careers? I need to figure this out. So it was really wonderful to see the growth of the Bridgeport Public Education Fund from really starting off at a, let's give money to projects and classrooms and that'll you know be the silver bullet. And then we said, oh no, direct service, let's go in, let's bring um, adults initially. Now let's change this model a little bit because we have some data to support that. Then we ended up going to the mentors and to the college as a near peer model. However, we still found ourselves being challenged. And that is where in 2003, we were again assessing data, understood that we were doing the work, but were we really getting the results? A number of our students who were mentored in the program, we were sending them off to college, but we weren't tracking to ensure that they either persisted or completed. Well, in 2003, we were able to make that pivot, if you will, and it's been a successful pivot ever since. Uh, we have our college assistance program, which actually allows for the Bridgeport Public Education Fund staff to support and offer financial incentives, uh, such as tuition reimbursement, um, textbook purchases, a number of things for students who were mentored in our high school program. Because again, we don't want to um, and, and Dr. Weinberger talked about this a lot, and it also shows up in the elements of effective practice. We didn't want to abandon these young people. We did a lot of work in trying to empower and engage them. But once they finished high school, in, in the initial stages of our mentoring program, um, we had to pretty much shift. So I, I want to make sure that, um, you know, we can have a little discussion about that. Uh, but in that shift, it got us to the point where we are today. And the point that we are at today is where we're able to really think about um, how do we become better partners, not just with our partner school, which is the Bridgeport Public Schools District, but also with a number of our, of our community partners, right? We have uh, programs like Riot that 
We have programs like uh, TSTT. We have other community partners, Bridgeport Caribe Youth Leaders, um, the Greater Bridgeport STEM Learning Ecosystem, where we're able to really understand that we may have a limited capacity. We may have a uh, much more narrow vision because as of 2019, the Bridgeport Public Education Fund mission was refined to really talk about the, the work that we do and the data that we can measure, which was to mentor youth for success in college careers and life, uh, to put a cap on that, if you will. And um, as we move forward, knowing that we have a number of alumni, what we're seeking to do now is bring the alumni back to their community, into their schools, and now create either a career model where we're able to really um, help students see themselves and other people that were in these seats 10 to 20 years ago, but also um, moving the Bridgeport Public Education Fund and mentoring out of the walls of the school building and out fully into the community. Because again, um, with so many things that are happening, we saw a number of tragedies unfold in different parts of the country nearly every day. And um, we now understand we can't just rely on some of the successes of the past. We really have to think about and plan for the future with our partners and understand how we can um, utilize the resources that we have and build up some of the components that we do not have. So partnering is important and critical, but so is uh, learning from the past. So thank you, Dr. Weinberger. Thank you, Joe, for inviting me. And um, I look forward to working with many of you in some capacity in the future. Thank you so, so much, Faith. And you brought back wonderful memories. I remember David Carson and his bow tie and <laughs> Philip Gustafson. I guess I've been around too long. Um, thanks so much. Jasmine Prezi, as you heard, is a very unique role, having been a mentee and a mentor and now the director of the Norwalk Mentor Program. It's one thing to found a program, but it's another thing to leave it in such good hands. So it is a pleasure now to introduce Jasmine Prezi. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm so excited to be here amongst you all. And, you know, I just want to say thank you for your service for the community. I know sometimes we say that amongst to police officers or elected officials, but you are serving the community as well. And those who are logged on, you care about the community or you're doing the work as well. So just thank you all for your service. I know firsthand that this is not easy, you know, not easy work at all, but it's so rewarding. And I'm just so grateful to be able to lead this wonderful program, this historic program. You know, when Dr. Weinberger was, was speaking about it in the beginning, you know, I was just getting goosebumps and just feel so grateful to be able to pick up, you know, pick up this program and just continue it to, you know, the success that we have had. Um, and, you know, when I'm here in my role every day, I just think back to when I was like in first grade and I can still, I still have those feels, you know, I still remember what it was like to, you know, run down the hall and see your mentor at the main office. So it really does push me, you know, in my daily work to have, for each student to have that same, you know, same emotion when they see their mentor. So matching mentors and mentees are, is my favorite part, you know, of the program. It's kind of like matchmaking is, you know, what it feels like, but, you know, just to see, you know, on paper, a child's need and a mentor's strengths and be able to, you know, match who and who up together is just, you know, such rewarding. So, you know, as you guys know, we are, we were founded by the Dr. Susan Weinberger and we are the Norwalk Mentor Program. Um, we serve grades from K to 12. It's for students that are in the Norwalk Public Schools. Um, each mentor meets their mentee in person for one hour a week during the school day. And we focus on matching students with mentors who are chronically absent and display problematic behaviors. So that is a initiative that the Norwalk Public Schools approached us to work on and we we do that and also too we match we work with students who have many different needs as a, as the slide that Dr. Weinberger read earlier we are matching students who have lost a parent who are now in the system who have mental health challenges who maybe are soaring academically 
but don't have the friends, right? Don't, don't have the peer supports, don't have a, you know, the relationship skills that you need to be successful in any part of the, any career that you go in, right? We need, to, kids need to know how to secure relationships. So we are matching students with various needs. And as I'm sure all of you know, the needs have changed, you know, due to COVID. So the, since the needs are changing with our students, so are the, you know, the criteria and different um, reasons of why we are matching students. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. We currently have 372 active mentor mentee matches that are meeting this school year. Um, typically, you know, um, we would stop maybe matching mentors and mentees, I think like around January or February, but I personally as a leader have kept that going to as, you know, as, as quick as we can get them in there before the end of the school year, I have been matching. I've even matched up until a month ago because time is of the essence. Do we really need to cut it off just because we feel like it's not enough time? You never know if what that mentor needs, if they need that support and if the mentee needs that support, right? A mentee may just have went through a traumatic experience last week. That doesn't mean that we should have to wait until the fall to make a new match because we as a outsider feel like it's not enough time to make a connection. Well, we know students are yearning for this one-on-one -on -one attention, you know? There's so many students who are, have five siblings, four siblings, you know, have parents and caretakers who are doing the best that they can, but don't necessarily have the time to read to their child every night, to sit on the floor, you know, and play Monopoly and sing songs and different things like that. So that's where the mentors kind of come in. And that's why community partnerships are so important and how the program really does keep going. And Dr. Weinberger mentioned such a critical part of school-based mentoring is a school liaison. You know, you'll get great liaisons who enjoy this work. And then some, you know, you may have to, you know, send 10 emails before you get a response. But, you know, I treat them both the same and I work with any type of person. But the school liaisons are really such a critical part of the program. Majority of our referrals come from the school liaisons. I would say about 90% are coming from the school liaisons and they really can foster a match along. You know, there's liaisons who... Set up, you set up meet and greets with myself and the mentors and the family so we can all come in and be on the same page, on the same page and really know what this child needs. There's many school liaisons that go above and beyond a call of duty and mentors really do feel welcomed by them because I'm a director, you know, I work out of my office. I'm not in the school every day or every week. So when a mentor goes into the school, they are greeted by that security guard and by that main office staff and by the liaison. So they are the ones who are really pushing the relationship along. You know, so the school liaisons, you know, I'm, as Dr. Weinberger pointed out, I'm always thanking them for doing what they do in their regular role and then this added role as well. And then also too, for them to kind of keep the, keep the program going along. So I like to give them thank you gifts before the school year, the end of the school year. Um, so they're such a critical part of our program. And next slide. Oh, and I also wanted to mention too, and to the point where, you know, as I continue to match students later in the year, given COVID, you know, I started right at the beginning of COVID. I will, beginning of the school year, I. I started in 2020. So, um, you know, we were virtual, we were virtual and then we did the hybrid model as well. So being that now we are, we know that Zoom can work, right? We know that it can step in and really be, you know, a point of contact for someone. You know, we are encouraging for mentors to keep that going in the summer to stay, you know, stay on Zoom and connected with their student. Um, as far as for the future for the Noah Mentor Program, we're looking to expand our model and our approach and our successes to other school districts in Connecticut. And then uh, mentor retainment is so important. You know, I wanna be more intentional. In the past, we've always done workshops, whether it's quarterly, you know, I wanna do something more frequently where veteran mentors can really mentor new mentors, you know? You know, the first year of mentoring is so critical of what, whether you wanna stay or not. So we wanna make sure that mentors are feeling supported. I'm transitioning back into in-person events and also to a summertime connection. There's a local camp that's here on, at another school during the school year. So we can continue school-based mentoring during the summer. 
So I know I'm, my time is coming up. So I want to say thank you all for listening. And I look forward to connecting with all of you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And you know, um, we had uh, some questions and maybe we can review them and answer them directly to the person who, um, who raised each one of them after this is over. Thank you to all of my colleagues. I know Joe has to move on, so I'll be really quick with my final thoughts. The friendship focus of mentoring is difficult to measure for funders, I know, but I have seen some remarkable results, so never discount this goal, my friends. The principal teachers and the beloved secretary still absolutely key to a successful program. Many potential mentors will not want to be trained to become mental health professionals or educational advisors. They just want to help and make a difference. One more slide, Joe. I believe that every intervention for mentees today is unique. There is really no one size fits all. We should carefully determine what strategy would benefit a mentee the most. And I reiterate, we cannot do it alone. Going forward, we must create and expand our community partnerships as you saw and heard today. And the last slide, school-based mentoring prog programs do not change lives. Relationships do. Tasha may have thought that I was her hero, remember that song, and everything she wished she could be, but I learned as much, if not more, from her than she did from me. With our bond came the deepest friendship, respect, patience, and loyalty. We celebrated Tasha's successes together. Some of her impulsive decisions and disappointments made me sad, but I refused to give up. Skeptics may say that it's difficult to establish a meaningful relationship between two unlikely souls. They must not have had my experience. I still argue that case often with my colleagues. My mentee, who I met when she was seven in second grade, died at age 34 on December 22nd, 2019. Thank you, Joe. We just about made it in time, didn't we? Well, we went over by a couple minutes. Oh, now, Joe, stop complaining. <laughs> no, I'm not complaining because it was all good. It was all wonderful uh, information. And I find it very inspirational. I love it. I um, understand that Zoom has a poll that is supposed to automatically launch. I'm not exactly sure how, how that works. So I'm going to go on and tell you, remind you to uh, go to the upcoming sessions. We have a short break. And then at 2.15, we have breakout sessions. We have two of them, one called Mentoring with Emotional Intelligence and the other Mentoring for Prevention, whatever you mentor needs to know about substance use. And then at 315, we have our plenary, which is on everyday mentoring, because every moment counts, or every moment matters. And we have our closing where Kermit Carolina will come back and give his uh, insightful thoughts about the overall uh, school-based showcase and what we've learned today and his impressions. So uh, please take a break. Uh, get something uh, cool to drink and come back at 2.15, okay? Thank you to all of you who presented today. Thank you, Dr. Weinberger. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, uh, Faith. Thank you, uh, Annalise and, um, and Sarah. It was fantastic learning about your programs. I'll see you in a few minutes. <laughs>